uh, not a, a release uh, after Dust to Dust? Oh, actually, after that, I mean, after both me and Serge had the uh, the solo albums, I mean, we just, I mean, I, I just left the music business, basically. And I, I was, at the time, I had so many problems with Def Jam over having my own thing with Columbia and Hoppo that there was a lot of bad blood between me, Russell, and Lior, and, you know, didn't want to do anything after that, especially with Def Jam under that contract. Um, yeah, it was, like I said, there was a, like this power struggle going on between Lior and Donnie Einer with the whole big Def Jam deal where they, they ultimately stepped from them anyway. So, but, you know, I was kind of like in the middle of that power, <laughs> power grad that was going on, which wasn't too fun at the time. Right. So catch us up to speed. I think we all follow your page because uh, you have some great memorabilia. How did uh, all of that come about? And how long have you been collecting? Well, I I never really fully like collected stuff. It was just like stuff that I have that just you know you just save in the course of you know going through the business and performing. But more recently, like maybe like six years ago, I I reconnected with Paradise, and Paradise is actually he has always been like an insane collector of hip hop. Like, like even going back to like the seventies when he was just going to jams, he has like all his flyers from all the jams he went to. Like he was, uh, he lived in the same building as disco King Mario. He uh, carried crates for Imperial JC with the Herculoids. Then he moved to Brooklyn and, you know, he promoted parties out there, got together with Lumumba. So through all these periods, he just saved everything. Now, I, I mean, I saved a lot of stuff, too, but, like, he saved from a much earlier period. So when he did his Latin Quarter book, I started working on another book that was kind of like an illustrative history of the entire era from 83 to 92. So in the meantime, we joined forces, and we've been working on this book for several years now. And hopefully, you know, depending on what goes on with this whole COVID you know, circus here and what, what happens in the future with publishing, we're hoping to get this book out. And uh, it's really the most comprehensive thing I think that's ever been done, at least on the culture and on the, you know, hip hop, you know, the full scope of it for that, that whole time period. And what also developed from that, Paradise is working with the Universal Hip Hop Museum from day one. And I was helping him out here and there, but we became you know, closer on that project. And then I became like his assistant curator with him. He's the uh, chief curator. So we just pulled off the whole exhibition for the 1970s up in the Bronx at Bronx Terminal. So, you know, and we've been able to pull like so many other artists and so many other writers and other hip hop figures have been generous with, you know, photographs, artifacts, contracts, everything under the sun. And uh, that's really what's made it. And like reconnecting with all these people um, you know, I, I reconnected with Joe Ski Love recently and got to see like Joe Ski Love's original contracts when he was doing Pee Wee Herman. Um, MC Sweetie G, who uh, was the first Queens MC, his contract when he was uh, on Mike and Dave Records when he did the album, uh, the album Fast Money that came out in 86 where Positive K had the song Getting Paid. Sweetie G produced it, so he had the actual contract. Now, that takes me full circle because when Lumumba started managing me, he was managing positive in 86 when getting paid came out. That was like my first, one of my first memories of with Lumumba. Like he passed me like a, a 12 inch of getting paid. And it's like, yo, you know, positive K is dope. And, you know, next thing you know, he's got King Sun, just nice hey, fucking with Stetson Sonic. So that was like my whole introduction to the music business, you know, on that level. So, and that, and that's, and that's how I met paradise through Lumumba because they were partners. So in, in, in some way paradise was managing me at that point too, but he was much more tied in on all of the performances and the club dates. And that's how he started to uh, promote at the Latin quarter. So, you know, the LQ was just like the golden age of New York city. It's never going to be anything like that again. And, you know, Paradise was really instrumental in making that happen. 
Yeah, so many people went through there, so many acts established there. What's the status of your book? Um, we're really, the book right now is close to 600 pages, so it has to be edited down. We were thinking about doing it in two volumes. So uh, we weren't set on the publisher. We, we've had it to a number of publishers, but a uh, uh, guy who did the Born in the Bronx book, Johan, uh, we're working with him right now. So he's trying to do his own imprint, I think. So we're waiting to see how his deal comes together. And we're hoping that it comes out as soon as possible. If I was to come out with a book, my years would probably be 87 to 97. You came up with which years and why? 83 to 92, the end of 92. When you when you look at the different time periods in hip hop, like let's say you look pre 83, like what happened in 83, Run DMC. So you know you can really just take the advent of Run DMC and right at the end of 1982, the famous tour of Europe that you know Fab Five Freddy, all the graffiti writers. Um, Bambada, DST went on the tour to Paris and like really brought hip hop to the world. So that was like right at the end of 82. And then you have, you know, Run, D and J kind of like just totally changed the game. So I kind of like look at that as like almost like a landmark happening in 83. So many things were changing in 83 that was so different. You know, you look at how Cold Crush and Fantastic were in Wild Style and just with the dress and with the style of their music being more like the old school routines and then, you know, Run DMC and the advent of Russell and, you know, Rush Productions and just all those artists. And then you even go into 84 with LL and Tila Rock. Um, you have the movies, you know, Beat Street coming out. So 83 to me is like really – and I don't know if you've seen the book Yes, Yes, Y'all that was done. That kind of like ended like right around 83, 84 period when, you know, Graffiti Rock came out, that stuff. So, I mean, you know, and you, you got to throw the Treacherous Three in there because they're kind of like the bridge in between the old school and the Run DMC era. Um, so that's why we started in 83. And if you go all the way with what's considered like the golden era, you get the, where Rakim transformed things and PE in 86 and 87. Then you go into like 89 with De La, straight through the early 90s where it's like the MTV age. If if we didn't cut it off like right at the end of 92, there would be so many other acts that had to we'd have to cover just for like one or two years from, you know, Biggie, Wu-Tang, Jay-Z, like everybody. So you can really see how – Right at the beginning of 93 is almost like a whole new era and even like new sounds, just just a whole a whole nother game. And when you when you look at all the material, it becomes even more clear. You can see how things happen. Like we use, you know, charts, other things that were happening, all the other influences on hip hop. And even like like I said, with MTV and with Yo MTV rap, starting with Freddie and then going with uh, with Dre. And with that lover and, you know, just the power that that had on bringing hip hop to a whole nother level and just it just kept growing. And, you know, all the changes with the labels and majors and Def Jam. So we kind of, you know, really cover everything. And like so many people have been supportive and, you know, really contributed like great material. Shout out to Monica Lynch, other like label people who save their archives and have, you know, real evidence of what like. You know, I actually interviewed Robert Hill, who was the owner of Zakia Records. And you actually had documents that showed that in April of 1986, Eric and Rakim made Eric B for president of Marley's Crib for $250. Wow. Think about that, you know. And when when they delivered, I think it was Eric had – melody on tape i think first and then robert said well can you make another one what do you want and i think he was ready to give him 2500 and robert said he asked for 250 so 
it was, so for 250 bucks, he almost got the two records done at Marley's Crib. Incredible. Which is ridiculous. So, but it's just like that, those backstories and all like the gritty details of what hip hop was and what it became is, you know, the type of story that, you know, we're telling, you know, and really hasn't been done before to this level. So it's like our contribution, even more so than the music that we made me in paradise. This feel that this is even more important than you know, what we did musically. Got to give a shout out to Barb, Bobito Garcia, who's, uh, Joining us today, Ito. super shout out. Well, are, Yo, you wait, are you waiting on anything for this book that's going to take it to that next level? Any archive or any piece? Um, actually, uh, Stretch's uh, boy Nick Quested. He took a lot of photographs at KCR, like in that period where Bob and, and Stretch were, like in the ninety one, ninety two era, and yeah, he has amazing photos. So. We want to look through his photo stash and you know the photographic end of the book is incredible like you know paradise's photo like I, I have good photos when i was on the road and rushing everything but paradise had him going straight through from like the roxy days like i mean he's got pictures of like dougie fresh and red alert at the roxy that you know you look at dougie fresh he looks looks crazy you know like he's got uh, the gazelles and the curls and you know red is like got the fro just red like looking like woody woodpecker there but it's just you know amazing to see the documentation of you know tila rock in a in his red leather suit at the roxy with his nameplate buckle just you know classic things where you've seen the photos post on instagram here and there but they've never really been credited or you know you know people tell you where they actually came from and that's the other part of like documenting the book too to show you know, where the photos came from, who documented the history. I mean, I, I got some pictures of, like, Tupac and a haircut on my in my bathroom from Daddy Rich, you know, drinking a 40. So it, it's like that range of, like, the stuff, the candid stuff that's on the road, in the studio, and, you know, just a lot of great, you know, captured a lot of great history. Bobito wants me to ask you, uh, what is the Fuzzy Pumper Barbershop? Oh, uh, Fuzzy Pumper... Fuzzy Pumper Barbershop was instituted by Bobito, the edge of King Garcia. Bob had the Clippers back in the day. And, yo, if you needed an edge up and you needed it bad, Bob would be there in a minute. He would have his, <laughs> his little smock there he put on you. He'd edge it up. And as long as you got some Entenmann's cake for him right after and he could dig in right there, just have a little party right after that cut, you know, the Fuzzy Pumper Barbershop was no joke. And, you know, Bob, just nice with the Clippers. What can I say? I mean, Subrock was nicer than Bob. Bob Bob had a whole different skill set. <laughs> Subrock, obviously, as you can see with Search, with the the edge-ups and the etchings into his, his hair were incredible. But actually, we had, like, Bob – and sub rock cutting in the fuzzy pumper barbershop many different times. So I mean think about that. Like hair cutting royalty. Fuzzy <laughs> pumper. <laughs> so so we got about eight minutes before we get out of here. Can you catch us up to speed? What's a day uh in the life like of Pete Nice and what do you got going on coming up in the future? Um the main thing and what takes up a lot of time, we have a lot of conference calls now with the Universal Hip Hop Museum. And uh, Paradise, myself, and, you know, we have a couple of people who are working with us. We, we did uh, the first exhibition covered the 70s up to 79. So the next exhibition we have is focusing on 1980 to 84. And we have, you know, people like Michael Holman, Charlie Ahern, uh, who, you know, have – a whole nother level of like video material that's never been seen before. Like Charlie has a, this film that he shot at the celebrity club in 1980 at an MC convention with Kaz, KG, I think Ray Vaughn. It's just crazy. And it's like high definition, pretty much the earliest party film that exists. Other than I think, I think there's some cuts of the funky four that are from 1979, but they have no sound. 
and this one is the earliest. So he's he's letting us utilize that in the exhibition. Michael Holman has, in addition to his graffiti rock stuff, he has high definition footage of like parties at Bronx River in like '83 with like everybody, and it's supposed to be sick. So we're we're incorporating a lot of interactive stuff and video into this exhibition, as well as having you know, all the artifacts from flyers. Uh, the other project that I was working on, which unfortunately got cut short because uh, and then phase two passed recently. Um, I'd been working with phase probably for the last three years on a book that was just focusing his history and hip hop through his fly, you know, the party flyers that he created. Um, and with my boy, Short Shot LaRock, who has like, the largest flyer collection, we were trying to assemble every flyer that he ever did to, to the best of our ability. And, you know, his head would get fucked up when we'd pull out some flyers that he had never even remembered doing. And, you know, through that history, which really went from like the, the mid seventies, uh, he started emceeing and he was a B-boy writer, artist, uh, he was in a group called the Wicked Wizards where he was actually MC. He'd have flyers where he'd write the lyrics on the back of even flyers. So then he started doing Flash's flyers in 78, went straight through. So this book was, you know, a lot of work, a lot of time. And, you know, unfortunately when he passed, it really to get his, I, I got a lot of his input in emails and just discussions. But I really wanted him to write some things, you know, straight up from his perspective, which he did on a, on a lower level. I wanted him to go full, full blast on it, which we won't have. But along with his, uh, his manager, Dave, and the family, we're thinking that we can continue the whole project and finish it. So that's like the other project beyond the Paradise book that, you know, I'm focused on right now, along with all the Universal Hip Hop Museum stuff. And we did, we did have a lot of great, original phase two material at the universal hip hop museum too, which is, you know, pretty amazing. Well, I do thank you for your time. It's not every day we get to see you speak. We do enjoy your uh, page. Um, and don't forget, don't forget. I think you got the uh, DJ quick poster from Indiana, like in 90 paradise and I got to use for the book, right? Hang on. This one? That's the one, right. That's that that's on fire, man. And I just give you credit for ripping them off the wall. When you told me you ripped off those Wu Tang posters in Chicago. Absolutely. That's crazy, man. Pack so that and it definitely I know, took it off. Definitely um, a order. And you know, because it, it's just so hard for you know the big posters like that, the ones that are heavy on the heavy paper. Right. Shit. So appreciate you. Contributing that one. I know you got other stash there too, so we want to see some of the other treasures you got there. Definitely, day by day, piece by piece, and you do the same. Um, any uh, social media you want to shout out so people can continue to keep up on what you're doing? Um, just Rushtown two ninety eight is my Instagram, and uh, Walls of Shame is my Twitter, which I'm really not on that much. Mostly just on on the Instagram, and then uh, Universal Hip Hop Museum is U H H M. Museum, UHH Museum on Instagram, where we have a lot of information going out. And we'll probably, as this, you know, whole pandemic uh, develops and we see what schedules, you know, we're really looking forward to doing this next next exhibit. Actually, Sal Abatello from Disco Fever, he's involved with us breaking out his archives. And that's like kind of like at the transitional Run DMC period where, you know, Run and them did their first show at the Fever. Um, before they did the Celebrity Club. And actually, Sal's not feeling well, so shout out to Sal. You know, our prayers are with him. Um, but we have a lot of people contributing, so just keep 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 your eyes out there for the new Universal Hip Hop Museum Appreciate and exhibitions. want to see people out there. Appreciate that. we got about 25 seconds. Um, yeah. Like I said, this was uh, Quarantine Sessions, Episode 3. I hope everybody enjoyed it. I know I did. Thank you so much, Pete Nice. Yo, thank uh, you for having me, man. You've changed my it, life man. since 1989. Uh, no. Be on the lookout for me tomorrow. I have R.A., The Rugged Man, and Al Scratch. And uh, oh, we will see you soon. Thanks again. So, man, Pete.